Chapter One The Museum I never thought vampires would exist, let alone be from another planet. From Julie Sparks' Recovered Diary I sort of skip-walked toward the front doors. Before I reached them, though, three men in black suits entered the museum. One of them held a black duffel bag. Even with the suit on, I could tell he was well-built, and, for an older guy, he was pretty good-looking. Flirting with him crossed my mind, just harmless flirting, like smiling at him, yet I was too shy for even that. Like out-of-place foreigners, they paused and studied the room. Then their eyes fixed on me. The one in the middle said, We're here to take the statue. Okay, I no longer wanted to flirt with a bastard trying to steal Michael. What? No one was scheduled to take the statue. Everyone who worked there knew how I felt about Michael, and they would have told me. Marching past me, they advanced toward the statue. The one in the middle laid down his duffel bag next to Michael, opened it, and drew out a black rope with clips on the end. It was the same rope that rock climbers use. At least, it looked like the ropes I used when rock climbing last summer, or tried to anyway. After the man in the middle handed the rope to the other men, they looped it around Michael. They couldn't do this. They needed permission. I'm going to get the manager, I said. The one I assumed to be the leader casually approached me. Can't let you do that. Keeping a straight face, he backhanded me. I slumped to the floor like a limp doll. Dazed, I looked up at him. I had never been hit that hard before. Come to think of it, I had never been hit before, except that one time playing volleyball. Eyes filling with tears, I screamed, hoping the manager would hear me. The leader's evil presence became more apparent as it began to overshadow the peacefulness and warmth of Michael's, like black seeping into white, creating shades of gray that darkened with each pass. I thought about the leader being evil blackness, hiding behind a good-looking mask. If I were only strong enough to hurt him, to stop him, please, God, help me. The leader gripped my hair, dragging me toward Michael. The smell of his manly musk disgusted me. In an attempt to break free, I kicked, squirmed, and clawed at his wrist, ignoring the pain on my scalp. But then he caused more pain by digging his fingers into my arm. We both stopped struggling upon hearing the creaking sound again, louder this time. The men glanced around as if looking for the source. The leader released my hair, relieving my tender scalp from the burning pain. When he headed for Michael, I scuttled back, crab-walking, not stopping until I was as far from the creep as possible. With my feet, I pushed myself against the wall. Then, trying to shrink, I pulled my knees to my chest and hugged them. I just wanted to sit there and cry and pretend none of this was happening. My heart raced. What do I do? I didn't know what to do. I couldn't think straight. A popping sound echoed through the room, and the men stepped away from the statue, staring at it as if waiting for it to move. With a thunderous sound, a large crack appeared on Michael's chest and spread down his legs and across his arms. Pieces of stone crumbled to the ground, revealing a pale boy. Dust rose. He flapped his massive wings, and the remaining pieces of stone crashed against the marble floor. The wind created by the fluttering of his wings rippled through my hair. My heart thumped so hard I thought I might die. This couldn't be happening. Must be a dream. Wake up, Julie. I had no idea what in the hell to do. My thoughts seemed to overlap, telling me to run, scream, cry, but I sat unmoving as if I had become the statue. What on earth just happened? The three men stared like pigeons looking up at a shotgun barrel, sensing danger but still wondering, hey, what's that? I must have shared their expression because, though a statue had burst to life, I didn't sprint for the doors. Michael crouched and glared at the leader, revealing his sharp, angry fangs. I flinched. He catapulted from the floor, his movement a blur. The next thing I knew, Michael was on top of the leader 
with wings outstretched, arching over the scared little man. He sank his devil fangs into the man's throat. Through my tears, I cried out, Oh, God! I struggled to keep my lunch down. After another blur of movement, the second man was flung ten yards, smashing headfirst into a painting on the wall. It made the sound of a hammer striking a coconut. My stomach turned upon seeing the blood splattering against the wall and painting. The leader sprinted for the doors, realizing what the shotgun did to his pigeon friends. In a flash, Michael was behind the man, tearing into his neck. The leader squirmed in the arms of the devil man, kicked, twitched, and finally went limp. Michael faced me and glanced up from his crouched position, his shiny eyes catching my fearful ones. As if ashamed, he dropped the body, looked away, and with his forearm wiped the blood from his mouth. Was I next? None of this seemed real. I surveyed the room. I was in the middle of it, where peaceful Michael had once stood under lamps. There was a hallway on each side of me, but they were the same distance as the front doors where Michael stood. Even if I tried, I wouldn't make it to either hallway before he sank those scary fangs into my tender neck. I was the remaining pigeon, the practically retarded one, who would have tried to eat the gun that had blasted her friends to bits. Because Michael turned completely around, I could only see his backside. He stretched his wings out as a man stretches his arms after a long day of work. Afterward, he tucked them close to his body. Then, the strangest thing happened. His wings shrank, retracting into his back, under his shoulder blades, and completely vanished. His back was smooth now, very human-like. I didn't remember moving, but I was now on my knees, my hands trembling at my sides. The thought of running crossed my mind again, but I didn't know where to go. Slowly, he twisted around to face me. Our eyes locked. From this distance, his eyes looked like dark shadows with a hint of shine in them. They reminded me of the way a cat's eyes look in the dark when light hits them just right. Hair black, long, and draped down the sides of his face, he looked like a sexy anime character. A sexy evil anime character who transforms into a demon and slaughters humans. My eyes traced down his slim yet well-built body. I must have been in shock, horrified, something, because it wasn't until that moment that I realized he was naked. If he didn't look like a young man, I wouldn't have blushed and looked away. When I glanced back up at him, he dropped his head, abashed, and fled out the front doors, leaving behind a long, streaked blur. Without thought, I lunged forward, my arm extended, reaching for him. I wanted to say something, tell him to wait, but he was gone. Belatedly, I realized the insanity of my behavior. Why did I want him to stay? He just murdered three people, and I wanted to talk with him? Shock. That must be it, I said to myself. I took a moment to survey the damage, wondering how my manager, Frank, didn't hear the earlier commotion. I didn't know what to do. Call the police, get Frank. You see, officer, the statue came to life, and, I said to myself, they'll think I'm nuts. So, I did what any 17-year-old girl would do in my situation. I ran. Once I was a good distance away, I slowed my pace and walked the city streets. The nightlife was active as ever. Flashing neon signs, low-rider cars, half-naked women, and trash-filled sidewalks decorated downtown San Francisco. Oh, and the gay couple making out on the street corner. The open gayness the city by the bay is known for didn't bother me. I'm sure to any outsider the nightlife in San Francisco would seem wild, a devil's playground, or perhaps they would relish in it. If they traveled near Hate Street, they would be welcomed by hookers on every corner, their pimps close by. They would pass porn shops every other building and filthy strip clubs often enough. 
but to me it was everyday life. The nightlife didn't seem so dark in comparison to what Michael did, yet I wanted to see him again. Oddly enough, I wasn't afraid of him. Not anymore. I needed to see him again, and that was pretty twisted. Something must have been wrong with me. I couldn't explain it. All I knew is the same peaceful feeling Michael used to give me. I'd felt again when he'd stared at me before he'd fled out the doors of the museum. Maybe people were right about me being naive. Maybe they were right to believe that one day I would end up beaten and left for dead in a dark alley. I covered my hands with my long sleeves, crossed my arms, and walked. As I passed, a group of punk rockers a little older than I was, one of them said, Bud for sale. Without taking my eyes off the ground, I kept walking. Even if I did smoke weed, and I didn't, I wouldn't have responded. I was too shy. The punk rockers were far behind me when I passed by a dark alley and heard the same swooshing sound I'd heard at the museum. Startled, I jerked and looked up. It sounded like it was coming from above me, but I didn't spot anything. Yet I sensed a familiar, tangible presence. The same peaceful feeling Michael had brought to the museum. Keeping my eyes fixed on the alleyway, I walked backward down the sidewalk, imagining Michael crouched down, hiding in the dark shadows. Then, after brief consideration and a short pause, I stepped into the alley, knowing only big-breasted airheads in horror flicks would have done something so stupid. Then, after brief consideration and a short pause, I stepped into the alley, knowing only big-breasted airheads in horror flicks would have done something so stupid. <laughs>